State leaders agree to the need for a special session, and policymakers pick winning projects to protect our environment. We explain in this week's Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The LCCMR, it stands for the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources and it's comprised of 10 lawmakers and 7 citizens. They choose among many proposed projects to protect Minnesota's environment and resources. Funding for those projects is generated from the constitutionally dedicated Environmental Trust Fund and their decisions are sent to the legislature for final approval. Producer John Brune explains. Environment and natural resources play a major role in Minnesota's identity as a state. As well as being a significant year-round source of outdoor recreation, these resources are also natural habitats for many species. One of the ways in which Minnesota protects and improves its natural resources is through the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Well, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund was set up to kind of broaden our environment and natural resources including increasing habitat, but it also has much broader uh, implica implications. It, it's to, we, the, the state has funded a number of uh, environment ed education programs out of that, a number of studies that, that lead to, try to improvements of the environment and natural resources in the state. The Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund consists of state lottery proceeds and investment earnings. By law, the fund's balance cannot be spent only a percentage of the balance may be used each year on environment-related projects. It's the job of the LCCMR to decide where that percentage should be spent. Of the net proceeds, 40% of the money gets deposited into the trust fund. Now, except for the amount that's allowed by the Constitution, that fund cannot be spent directly. It's, there's about $600 million in, the, in, in there um, right now. And what the, what the, what the commission does is they make a recommendation on five and a half percent per year. And what they'll do is, is they'll allocate that to specific projects. They're going through that process right now. And they will have a list of projects that they'll recommend to the legislature um, in, in January. And that, that will be a list of what they've determined to be uh, the highest priority projects to, to fund. And the legislature can do as they will with it. Sometimes they've made changes, sometimes they haven't. Um, but they will take those recommendations and then appropriate money uh, from the trust fund um, as, as allowed under the Constitution um, and then appropriate for specific projects. And there are a number of, you know, sometimes they've had hundreds of projects that have come forward, but uh, and I'm not sure this year if they'll have quite as many, but it'll be, uh, there'll be a, a number of things, including some environmental education, some habitat improvement. Uh, be, you know, they're, they're, they're have, they have a number of projects they're looking at right now. Once the LCCMR concludes its work, the legislature decides on the recommendations and begins work on legislation to appropriate funds to the proper agencies. The task of the commission this summer was to allocate $33.8 million for fiscal year 2014, which begins next July. Steve Senek interviewed several of the commission members to discuss their role and the difficult decisions they faced. What set of criteria do you personally use when you are determining the value of a project? Well, first of all, we have to look at the rules and regulations that are set up for the LCCMR projects and when we take a look at that then I look how they're going to affect the communities what they're going to bring to the communities that they're that these projects are in and also what they're going to do for the environmental natural resources and what kind of an effect and impact that'll have well I think that we have to make sure that we protect our natural resources but we also have to make sure that in so doing that that we allow agriculture to operate so that it can operate efficiently and I firmly believe that we can have an agricultural industry and we can have natural resources in our environment that work together. It's complicated. We have a system where we're scoring this on nine different criteria and, and each group of projects there's different things that come come to higher levels. Uh, one, of the, one of the big ones I look for is leveraged funding. Are they bringing other funds? We don't want to pass up the opportunity to bring other funds if somebody's bringing in half or sometimes 80 percent. Boy, those are high rated projects as far as I'm concerned because we get a lot more bang for our buck. I think the most important thing is to prioritize these as to what they're going to do for the state of Minnesota and the environment that we're in. And they have to be doing positive, direct uh, things for Minnesota and that's how I prioritize them. I think you have to take a little longer term view on some of these things. 
Well, the aquatic invasive issue is both long-term and short-term. We need to be doing things to stop the movement of it right now. But at the same time, we have to be taking a long-term approach so that we can figure out ways to uh, not only just reduce the speed with which it's spreading, but to stop it. None of the projects would be ones that you wouldn't like to see happen, but there's just so many dollars, so you have to figure out where those dollars, in my opinion and everybody else's opinion, where those dollars will do the best and be the best spent. One of the things we found, and, and LCCMR has really been one of the leaders for dealing with uh, invasive species funding, and, and, and it's because we have these critical needs and we're behind the eight ball. We're, we're uh, so far behind on some of these that there's critical things that need to be done or we're never going to catch up. And fortunately in Minnesota we have people that are forward thinking enough to say, hey, these are the next things on the horizon. I mean, we'll see some other projects this afternoon where they're saying, there's these terrestrial invasives in, in Wisconsin and Michigan, they're going to be here. Let's snuff them out when we know we can. Invasive species, once they've taken control, it's very difficult to come back from that. So being proactive about preventing it in the first place has to be a high priority, but you can't just let the zebra mussels go because they're here either. So, so it's a, a, a really dynamic and you have to do everything kind of soup to nuts. The, the long-term planning to the actual application of what we know we can do that is effective. But do, you, do you expect the legislature to follow the recommendations of the commission because the last legislative session they discarded some? We hope so. That, that you know, I think one of the things that, as a citizen, I see as a service providing to the legislature is to go on through this, seeing all the presentation, vetting through this, taking a science approach, a real systematic approach, and saying this is the universe of people uh, that have responded to our RFP. This is our best consideration of what we think should be funded. And, and, and it comes down to some people don't get funded. Worthy projects don't get funded. But yet, I, I hope that the legislature does that. If, if they, uh, we're doing a lot of work for them and giving them our advice, and, and, I, and I hope they hear that and, and, and see that the deliberations we've made are in the open, cover no stone unturned. Among the commission's top priorities for the next fiscal year, they allocated $4.35 million for the University of Minnesota's Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, $2.65 million for Department of Natural Resources Minnesota Biological Survey, roughly $1 million for water resource sustainability efforts, and roughly $1 million for improved water management. Co-chair of the LCCMR, Representative Tom Hackbarth, joins me right now to talk a little bit about the meeting and the, the big picture for the LCCMR. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So let's begin, Representative Hackbarth, with how do you feel about the Commission's priorities for fiscal year 2014? Well, um, I think we made some really good choices. I think uh, the Commission d uh, put, a, put together a great package. We started out with, I think it was somewhere in the area of 168, 169 projects. Uh, we whittled that down to about uh, 68 proposals that we had people come in, uh, different groups, different organizations, and, and present their uh, uh, proposals to us. And uh, yesterday we whittled that down to about 48 proposals and projects that we are going to fund. Protecting water resources and curbing aquatic invasive species seems to be a pretty high priority this year. Do you think the legislature will support these projects? I, I think uh, not only the legislature will support these projects, but uh, also the people. The, uh, the citizens out there want these things addressed. Uh, Asian carp, uh, uh, buckthorn, all these different uh, invasive species issues you hear a lot about on the news nowadays. Uh, people want something done with this, and I think we're moving in the right direction. One issue that was raised in this week's meeting was the need to support administrative functions that agencies and other organizations incur when managing these projects. And do you feel that it's important that the agencies help support these costs, kind of a partnership. Well, I think uh, the agencies have kind of been uh, uh, subsidizing, putting these plans together and implementing them and maybe even bearing some of the cost in to uh, their proposals as they present them. But uh, I think uh, the DNR are, are the ones that came forward with this and they're trying to be more transparent on their cost in administrating uh, these proposals. So I think they want to be more upfront say these are the costs uh, associated with these proposals and we want you to know that we need additional money to implement these uh, proposals that are important 
and uh, we need that kind of funding. Is now, that a fair request? I think it's a fair request, particularly when you look at the list of items that uh, you can spend LCCMR money on and the list of items that you can't spend LCCMR money on. And when they say these are the things that we're going to spend these additional administrative uh, costs on, we'll see that those items are in the category that are allowed to be spent uh, uh, with the LCCMR dollars. Chair Hackbarth, we're in the third year of a six-year strategic plan for the LCCMR. How's that process coming along, and have you found that it's shifted a bit from when it began? Well, I, I, I think things are going very, very well. What I would like to see uh, uh, next year and, and in the near future, if you look at the proposals that were presented, most of the proposals came from uh, state agencies and uh, from the University of Minnesota and other universities and, and uh, uh, educational institutions. And I think we need to move more into a direction of uh, trying to get some of these other groups in. Uh, when I was first on the old LCMR, uh, we had a lot of different groups coming in with innovative ideas uh, for other kinds of technology, et cetera, and we don't see that happening anymore. I would like to see LCCMR move more in the direction of uh, uh, opening up and uh, easing up some of the uh, paperwork and some of the burden and some of the bureaucracy that uh, groups have to go through in order to get to be a uh, proposal that's going to be presented to the LCCMR. Give me some examples of some of these smaller groups. Well, I mean, there's, uh, uh, you know, different like Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, um, uh, Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. There's a whole list of other groups out there that no longer apply for LCCMR money, and, uh, and we used to see that a lot. Uh, I, I only name a few. Those are the ones I'm familiar with. There's many others that people don't even hear of, but uh, I think that we have to get more of these smaller groups involved in applying for some of this money. What did the other members of the commission think about that idea as well? Uh, some of the other legislative members that I've talked to are on board with that. I have not taken that up with the other citizen members, but uh, I, I think they would be on board with that too. Let's talk about funding for environmental projects overall. It comes from so many different pots, legislatively speaking, and there are some from the general fund as well. Now, with many of these pools of money that were established to supplement but not supplant general fund dollars, do you think that since there's the expectation of another budget deficit in this next fiscal cycle, do you think those general fund dollars for the environment could go away because there are so many other ways to fund the environment. Well, there is a lot of ways to fund it. Uh, uh, the voters approved the new uh, legacy money, the uh, Parks and Trails and Lassard money, etc. And uh, the voters wanted that. So uh, that money is going to be set aside. There's, that's not going to change. LCCMR money is not going to change. And we have in statute that you can't supplant. So there's already some ongoing fund funding from the general fund that's going to continue to happen. Additional money for those same areas might be harder to come by. Do you think the, there could the be a big fund. reduction? I don't know that you'll see a reduction, particularly in those kinds of areas. Uh, maybe some other parts of uh, the DNR or the Pollution Control Agency or the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, but I don't think so, not in those kinds of projects. Okay, I want to get your perspective on working on a commission that's made up of legislators and citizens compared with a legislative committee. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you think of the, the makeup? Do you think that the citizens in particular provide some valuable information? The citizens have done a great job in this process. I was really surprised yesterday when we put the entire package together, the input that they had. Um, I, I did not vote in favor of the LCCMR package when we put the citizens on the council. I thought that was the wrong thing to do. Um, I don't know that was the right thing to do today, but uh, it did go very, very well yesterday. Uh, everybody worked well together. Uh, I think most of the proposals were uh, recommended uh, and uh, uh, moved by the citizens. And, uh, and they made some uh, uh, cuts and reductions in some of the proposals. So all in all, it went very, very well and it worked out fine. And at times, the legislature rejected several of the commission's recommendations and set off in their own direction. So is the commission's efforts worthwhile, in your opinion? I think they're worthwhile. Uh, many years, uh, depending on who's in charge of the legislature, you see that uh, 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 the majority of the proposals are passed as is. Uh, there might have even been some years when they were just passed through and passed without any changes. But uh, it is uh, uh, up to the legislature to approve them and have the final say, and I think that's the way it should be. Okay, Representative Hackbarth, we're out of time. Thank you for your time. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks for having me.
One member of the LCCMR is also a longtime member of the legislature, Representative Tom Rukavina. Steve Senek met up with him to discuss his work with the commission. The LCCMR has roughly $34 million for FY14 projects, but the amount of requests that came in is twice that. So how do you prioritize projects? Well, you know, whether it's at the LCCMI or, or at the IRRB that I sit on, you always get a huge amount of requests and you don't have that much money to work with. So I think, at least as a legislator, I look at, to be quite honest, you know, is it going to help my part of the state? Is it going to help, you know, the people I represent and the industries I represent? And, and I go from there. But you get lobbied a lot, too, from... Uh, Friend, friends of yours in the lobbying industry and uh, you try to do what's best for the state. You know, the LCMR uh, was supposed to do good things for the environment, but it's also supposed to enhance and protect our natural resources. So, I mean, you, you look at those things and decide how you're going to fund it. You know, it used to just be called the Legislative Commission on Minnesota Resources, and then the citizens became more involved. Now it's called the Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources. Do you, what, what do citizens bring to the group? I never was in favor of it, and quite frankly, nor the uh, citizens sitting on the Lassard Sams Council. I think, you know, technically it gets back to the legislature. The legislature can change the recommendations from the LCCMR, and they can change the recommendations from the legacy money. And, and they substantially did that with the LCCMR recommendations last year. Yes, I and uh, I tried to do that whether I was in the minority or majority as I sat on the, uh, I still call it the LCMR, I just had to make the point that you know, the Constitution says the legislature raises funds and, you know, expends them or uh, appropriates them, and then the governor can say yes or no to it. And so when we got these citizens involved, I always thought, you know, granted, we, we would like their input, but we're the ones that have the election certificate that in the end have to answer to the people on how we spent money. So the process you're going through right now, th this week, is it useful? Well, it's it's useful in that all of the particulars of that project that's being funded have been, you know, they've been looked at, they've been vetted, whether by the citizens or the legislators that sit on there. And in that sense, it's useful, but in the end, it is ultimately the legislators that get elected in the Senate and the House that determine as that, as that moves forward into the, in both houses, into the Natural Resource and Environment Fiscal Committees, that they can say, ah, you guys gave too much money to this project, or we don't like this project at all. You know, as your role as a legislator, as you know, you're often approached to solve problems now. You're always dealing with immediate problems. Doesn't this afford you the opportunity to sit back and look long term? Well, and, and that's the argument, but you know, one person's pork is another person's bacon, so to speak, and you can see on there which people like projects and if their projects don't make that priority list, they're trying to, you know, get other people on the commission to get those projects back on board. So. You know, there isn't always, you know, perfectness, and it's not everything's perfect in funding. One of the top projects this year was for the Aquatic Invasive Species Center at the University of Minnesota, and, and, and when that was being discussed by the commission, you raised a very excellent point. You said, and I used to chair the Higher Ed Committee, and we would review these projects. Mm -hmm. Do you fear that we're moving, the state's moving more towards dedicated funding away from general funding? They are. and. You know, I opposed the two recent constitutional amendments, the one that uh, dedicated the sales tax on cars and trucks to the, uh, to the highway funding, and the, uh, the legacy money. Because once you start dedicating funds, you have no leeway. I mean, we're buying property. We're the, Minnesota is the third largest landowner in the United States of America behind Alaska and the federal government. We're buying all kinds of land, whether at the LCMR or at the Lassard Sams, and meanwhile, we're cutting schools, we're cutting uh, uh, the University of Minnesota and the Minsky system, we're not funding our nursing homes properly, and it's a dangerous situation. Are you saying our priori priorities are wrong? Well, I, I think so. You know, if we're going to dedicate everything, what's the, what's the use of having a legislature? You know? Should there be the expectation that 
Go on, but if I can get back to the point I made in the meeting this morning, sure. I mean, when I got elected in 1986 and came here in 87, 15% of the general fund budget went to higher education. Now it's down to 7.5% last year, I think almost 7%. That's a 50% cut. And, you know, student debt now in this country is at $1 trillion, more than credit card debt and car loan debt. We're going down a precarious uh, road here, and once you pass uh, constitutional amendments that dedicate money to clean water and the outdoors and the arts, or you know, take the sales tax on cars and trucks and you put it into uh, the Department of Transportation, you're not giving the legislature the leeway they need. Well, you parlay me into the next section of questions I would like to ask, and that's, you, you shocked all of us when you made the decision that you're not going to seek public office again. And you didn't have a speech on the House floor announcing that. Why did you reserve making that announcement, and what forced you to make that decision? Well, I've been here 26 years, and believe me, I have had a great time. I said I should have paid for this job, you know, because I've had a blast. But we, you know, it's serious business what we do here. And after a while, it just weighs on you. I'm 62 years old, and I've been here 26 years. I mean, you, you do not look. 62 uh, years old. I feel it, believe me. And, and you know, it, it starts to weigh on you. It, it's hard on your family. It's hard on your friends. And uh, eventually you have to make a decision. And for me, uh, you know, I was moving towards that decision. I, I got my first grandchild, you know, my little granddaughter. And I took care of her before I came to session because I didn't want her to go to daycare before she was a year old. And so I was there four days a week, and, and I'll tell you, I'm smitten, you know, and I thought I'm going to spend more time with her, and uh, I'm also going to get married uh, in October, and uh, I wanted to spend some more time with my, my new spouse. So, you know, it was the right time to move on. Ironically, when I ran in 1982 and I lost by 16 votes, I had been redistricted from Joe Begich's district, my township, which was Senate District 6 then, into Senate District 5 my hometown area of Virginia and that where I grew up. And now, with redistricting, we become Senate District 6 again. I thought that was kind of like a sign from God. <laughs> it's time to move on. So what advice do you have for those who are going to remain? Well, we have starved government to the point that we can't starve it anymore. And it, it saddens me that we have had, in the last decade, I think seven or eight deficits out of the last 10 years. Something's out of kilter in this state, and I think we have to come together. Governor Dayton is right. You know, the wealthy people got the breaks at the turn of the century, and now that we're, you know, we need money, we need funding, I think it's the wealthy that should help pay again. Uh, and a good example, uh, well, Governor Dayton's proposal to tax the wealthiest Minnesotans would have affected 68 people in St. Louis County, but instead, about 100,000 taxpayers, property taxpayers, got an increase instead of 68 people getting an increase on a fair tax, which is an income tax. We have to come together and admit that we need more money in this state and, and fund things again like taking care of our children, taking care of our seniors in the twilight of the years, and, and stop this craziness that's going on in college funding where, like I said, a trillion dollars now collectively and nationally uh, and student loan debt, that's not right. When you look back at your career, what will you be most proud of? Well, a couple of things. And I have to give credit to where credit is due here. You know, Arnie Carlson signed a law that I passed uh, uh, on the House floor and the Senate passed it, uh, saying that a mine was a, an important thing to this state and those resources belong mostly to the state and the University of Minnesota. And when a mine closes, we're going to have a a moratorium of a couple years where that bankruptcy court has to keep that mine in operating condition to give the state time to find somebody else to operate it. And because of that, United Taconite and Eblith reopened under a new owner. National Steel Kiwantan Taconite plant reopened twice now. And the infrastructure at, uh, at uh, LTV in Hoyt Lakes was saved so that our first copper nickel mine might be able to use that infrastructure there. That was for my constituents, and I think for the state, a very important law. But uh, another one that I'm really proud of is I took the mineral rights that the University of Minnesota owns, 
and I put it into a scholarship that they rightly named an Iron Range scholarship. And it one out of every five incoming Minnesota freshmen from all over the state at every campus of the university gets a thousand to two thousand dollars a year in a scholarship fund. It's the biggest scholarship at the U and I wanted people to have the same opportunity to go to college as I had. It was a lot cheaper when you and I went to college than it is today. So and any help we could give, you know, is important and I think that that fund and it's growing by the way exponentially because just ironically, Kiwant and Taconite, which was closed twice and then reopened with that other law, is now paying the university about eleven million dollars a year in mineral royalties. So the fund's growing fast. Uh, one very brief question. Uh, when the legislature comes back for a special session, will you give a final speech on the House floor? You are one of the most entertaining legislators that this building has ever witnessed. Well, I was afraid of what I might say that night because, you know, my mother told me to keep my mouth shut if I couldn't say anything good. And I could have said a lot of good, but I could have raised a lot of heck that last night. And I just kind of figured I'd walk away into the sunset. So I don't know if I'll say anything at all you know, if if and when we do come back in a special session. I think I've made my announcement and, I, and the press has been very kind to me and people all over the state. I got letters from people I have no idea who they are even thanking me for some of the things I did. So I think that was enough for me. I don't have to give another speech. Well, we certainly wish you the best and thank you so much for thank coming on the Thank you so much for everything you guys do. The staff around this place is wonderful and you're part of it, so thank you. Governor Mark Dayton and legislative leaders announced Wednesday they anticipate an August special session to approve state dollars needed to match federal funds for natural disaster relief. The exact date will be set once FEMA completes its assessment on the damages from flash flooding, heavy rains, and strong winds earlier this summer. I think we are in, in agreement about focusing the special session solely on disaster relief and you know we may have some judgment calls to make as to what actually constitutes a, an emergency which somebody's emergency may not be for someone else but, but I, I was very encouraged by the meeting and, and spirit of goodwill I want to thank all four leaders for being here and for agreeing to work together in a cooperative way and as I, I've said before when there's a disaster you know we're not Republicans or Democrats we're all Minnesotans you know when you see people at their uh, in their absolute worst that uh, they needed your help and that's what we're here for uh, we're here to help uh, those that are in, in special need uh, especially after you look at the devastation you know the four of us uh, flew over some of the sites and uh, you look at the devastation to the roads and uh, you know, the water, the, the path that it took, uh, you know, to the governor's point, it's a nonpartisan path. You know, it washed out homes, it washed out roads, it washed out bridges and didn't care if you were a Democrat or Republican or apolitical. Uh, it was going to, the fury of nature took out uh, a lot of homes, a lot of businesses and a lot of infrastructure. And There has been a remarkable volunteer effort in trying to get people's lives who've been turned very upside down. Uh, upright it again and put some stability back into their families. So to all of you who uh, have volunteered your time uh, away from your families to come up and help, uh, on behalf of the constituents in the Arrowhead Reason, I'd like to thank you. This completes this week's program from all of us at Senate Media Services. I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.